and she got no grants, I'll tell you that. And yet she found a simple thing that she could do, and it created beauty and warmth and nurture and protection. And I think that is what women do. They, they not only, not only has, has the Culver Girls Academy taken care of, of now some 30 babies over these years, but they've done it beautifully. They've done it in a way that people wear the beads, they play the CDs, they, the memory of it all is all so beautiful. So I think it has something to do with that element of delight that women bring to leadership. So that it's more than getting your way, it's getting your way and leaving everybody more delighted. The fourth piece, this thing about beauty, I don't, I don't, I think we all understand that. I mean, you, you don't have to have studied women's issues very long to know that women are, are more than willing to kill themselves for beauty. I mean, I'm, every generation does it in different ways, but um, that idea that our immortality has to do with our beauty versus this thing that lives beyond us, this, this soul, this who we're going to be, it is a classic, it's, it's a classic women's limitation, but it is one that when we get the other three going, we tend to get in perspective. Uh, I don't love the end of the story because he takes her up to Mount Olympus. I believe that even if he had not taken her up there, that at that point, she already would be immortal once she once she gets to the point that she realizes that her value is beyond the beauty or the activities or the wealth, she would have been on Mount Olympus already. Um, I, th I think about these things in terms of the particular quality that women leaders bring to, to global leadership in this day and age. I think it's, it's all changing all the time, but I think your generation is going to have a different experience than my generation. And the king or queen is that, that generative person we want to be when we're through with our lives. The lover is our relationship. The warrior is the, the things that we stand for, the, the issues we fight for. But the magician is the little piece of magic that we do that nobody else can do. And part of, I think, our education is learning to be a generative person, learning to be a relational person, learning to know what causes are right, should put our efforts towards. But there's also this learning how to know what it is that we do particularly well that nobody else can do. And I think you sort of start a trail with that as you figure out what you like in school sometimes or what people notice about you. I, I know Pam's interested in linguistics. Well, is everybody here interested in linguistics? <laughs> no. I mean, she can't imagine why everybody wouldn't be interested in linguistics. <laughs> but from the beginning, she wanted to know what they meant. She wanted to try them out. And she thought about, well, you know, this is what it means in English, but in that, that's her little magic that she probably did in some weird way when she was a kid. And as she is growing up, she's learned, now this must be the thing that I bring to the world. When I was little, I liked little kids. And I thought I think I like little kids. But I remember somebody coming to me and saying, oh, you know, you really like little kids, and they like you. And I thought, that's the dumbest magic. a baby grow up. I love the idea that that little baby can turn into a human being now. It stirs me. And that idea of how people should be with them is, is my little, my magic. I also like telling stories. And that has been part of how I've been a teacher. So all of you all have something like that. You might be the one that really likes to figure out what order things should happen in an event. 
somebody here loves figuring out what all the music should be. We like creating an atmosphere where people are more apt to have an experience. Um, you maybe like to bring kids to a room with you. You like thinking about social management. All of those things are, are many of them are still not named. I mean, they're careers either that haven't yet happened because you haven't, the world hasn't gotten to that point yet, or you haven't figured it out that that's what you're going to do. But I, I think it is important as you go into global leadership eventually to have your own magic. I, I know a lot of young people who they're coming out of college, they're, I just spent a lot of time in a team with a young woman from Spain a few months ago, and she wants to get a grant and be a, uh, you know, have somebody pay for her to do public policy work in Finland. Well, she doesn't bring anything to the table. You know, she doesn't, she hasn't studied early childhood, she hasn't studied public policy, she doesn't speak Swahili. She, she doesn't have the magic yet. So I would really encourage you all to get your magic before you go through school. But I also would encourage you to get your friends. And that's what I have seen in a real powerful way happen with all of you, setting up networks and friendships that are going to be able to get it done. And then I think your, 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 your will, your vision, you've already gone. You guys have already guessed that it's not going to be about um, a personal life of comfort, but it's going to be about a global life of service. And I think all of those things are going to come together for you and make an enormous difference in the way you do things at the school. So that's the beginning of the story. Now I want to go quickly to the middle of the story. The middle of the story is in 2004, Culver invited me to, to come and speak. We saw the Oprah video, and we thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we could be on Oprah? Now, seven years later, what we know, so Oprah is a TV show. It's not a humanitarian <laughs> answer. Um, what we found out is that um, the Gates grants are not going to solve the issues of orphans in Oakland. What we found out is that getting all the right medicines in the feed, I mean, we had no idea then it was a, a doable task, but right now, people in Kenya, and I believe in South Africa, have access to pretty much all the medicine they need to live a healthy life with AIDS. But what has not been solved is who is going to take care of the children in the meantime? We've got sticky, messy, confusing things that families are not something you can invent in a test tube. They're not something that you can apply. The pet bar I was can buy and sell. It's going to be done by um, by modeling, by relationships, by communication, by litigation, by all of the things that I think um, your generation of women leaders are going to be particularly good at. And it's not going to be done nation to nation to nation because the rights of children. This is um, this is been established across the world for about 10 years. The rights of children are higher than the rights of a nation. So if this is something that you all feel called to as women leaders, when we were going around the circle, I heard several of you all saying that you talked about it with passion and said, I'm giving you children. It is a, a, a specifically, a, a particularly good area for global leadership. And somebody who tells you, well, take care of the children in your own country, don't listen to them, because the children in our country will do better if the children in other countries do better. Children, injustice and inhumanity to children in Brazil is bad for children everywhere. So don't let them you know, do the Machiavelli thing and make pit local versus global children. Do both. They know we need both. Um, I think it's particularly suited to women who have these abilities to negotiate at the same time that they litigate. And I think it's particularly important for your generation to for the work of AIDS, I think, is the last frontier. So I, I thank you all for your past and the part you played for Amani and these children in the past and for your